How y'all doing good people? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers. So please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is gonna give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo brokerage account. They're gonna give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. When you put $100 in your new Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. This is a limited time offer, guys. So don't delay. Get started today. Go down to the description box. Click on that Moomoo link. Open up that Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. I'm going to also extend to you guys two videos. The first one is my wealth transfer blueprint video. And in that video, it outlines the three big boy blue chip paper assets that I'm going to be buying in 2024 and beyond to double my net worth. I'm gonna also send you a Moomoo tutorial video. I did this video to be able to walk you guys through how to use the Moomoo app in order to make your first trade. If you want those two videos, all I'm gonna ask you to do guys is go down to the description box and locate my email address, send me an email, and just say, hey, Richard, I opened my Moomoo account. I funded my Moomoo account. Would you please send me those two videos, your wealth transfer blueprint, where you outline the three big boy blue chip assets you're gonna be buying to double your net worth over the next 10 years, and then send me the tutorial video so that I can learn how to navigate the Moomoo app so I can start buying my investments to get to my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I will do that for you. Again, guys, if you're going to build wealth, you got to be very decisive. You can't be indecisive. Indecisive people do not build wealth. They just procrastinate and make excuses. Decisive people build wealth. Why? Because they make up in their mind they're going to take action and they just go ahead and take action. Here's a call to action. If you want to build wealth, Get started today. Get down to that description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up your Moomoo account, and start building yourself some wealth. We got a lot to unpack today, guys. So I appreciate y'all for rocking with me. I appreciate y'all for, for, for tuning in today, tapping in today, because we got a lot of important stuff to discuss, and we're going to dive right on into it. The first thing we want to talk about is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is meeting today, guys, and tomorrow, and it's a critical, critical meeting for assets. I've always told you guys, assets thrive when interest rates are low. When interest rates are high, assets don't thrive the way they want to thrive. And right now, interest rates are super high. So the Fed is meeting today and tomorrow to decide what are we going to do with interest rates? Are we going to leave them higher for longer? Are we going to decide to cut rates? Are we going to decide to increase rates? And a lot of you are seeing the Fed ain't getting ready to increase rates. They, 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 they're done increasing rates. What are you talking about? This clickbait, your title ain't correct. Guys, listen to me here. 
the Federal Reserve Committee, when it comes to interest rates, is not unanimous on decreasing short-term interest rates. They don't have everybody in agreement. They don't. There are Fed governors out there who actually support increasing short-term interest rates. And guess what? I'm going to walk you through one of those Fed governors' recent comments. So this whole notion of, oh, it's a slam dunk. The Fed is going to decrease short-term interest rate. Hold your horses. Hold your horses. It's not a slam dunk. Especially with the last two months, we've had inflation being sticky. It's sticky, guys. It's not going down by itself. Now, the Fed hadn't increased rates since July of 2023, but you got to understand over these last two months, when we've gotten the last two CPI inflation reports, inflation is stagnant. It's sticky. It's not just continuing to go down on its own anymore. So the Fed has a decision to make. Do we increase rates and force it down? Do we keep rates right where they are and let's just see what it does over the next several months? Or do we prematurely reduce rates and, and, and the likelihood that inflation could reverse itself and go back up is a good likelihood. So we're not out of the woods wet yet. We're just not out of the woods yet. And there is not a unanimous agreement on the FOMC committee that they're going to just automatically reduce. Now, obviously, the Fed has said in, 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 in prior comments that they would they would see rate reductions as a possibility. It's us out here in the, 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 the world who are saying they're going to decrease. It's analysts, economists. Oh, they're going to be three rate reductions. They're going to be two. And I'm guilty of that too, guys. I believe there will be, but it's not unanimous. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I've always told you guys this. Prepare for the worst, but expect the best. Prepare for the worst, because I'm telling you, assets do not thrive in high interest rate environments. They thrive the best in low interest rate environments. That's the reason why when interest rates are high, assets typically fall in value, right? So let's, let's dive into my reason for thinking that the Fed could change course on us, guys, especially in light of the last two months with inflation not coming down and being sticky and stagnant. Here's the headline. Fed, Fed's Bowman, and Bowman is, is one of the, the Fed governors, not yet ready for rate cuts, willing to hike again if needed. This is what one of the Fed governors is saying. I'm not ready for rate cuts. I'm even willing to support increasing short-term uh, interest rates if need be. Let's read on. March 7th. Guys, this was just a, 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 a what, a couple weeks ago? This came out a couple weeks ago. The U.S. economy is not at the point where the Federal Reserve should reduce interest rates. That's her opening statement. The U.S. economy is not at the point where the Federal Reserve should reduce interest rates. Fed Governor Michelle Bowman said on Thursday. And while the baseline remains for falling inflation and eventually rate cuts, tighter monetary policy still couldn't be ruled out. Tighter monetary policy is simply this, increasing short-term interest rates. That's all, that, that's all they're saying there, right? While the current stance of monetary policy appears to be at a restrictive level, all that means is interest rates right now where they have it, has seemed to stop inflation from actually increasing. That's what they're basically saying. So the 5.5% Fed funds rate where it stands today has, has been effective. It's been effective 
by where it has stopped inflation from drastically increasing, right? That's basically what she's saying here. While the current stance of monetary policy appears to be at a restrictive level that will bring inflation down to 2% over time, I remain willing to raise the federal funds rate at a future meeting should the incoming data indicate that progress on inflation has stalled or reversed. So y'all tell me over the last two months, what has inflation done? It stalled. It stopped going down. The federal, listen, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, does not have a unanimous vote from everybody on his committee right now. He doesn't. I'm telling you right here what Fed Governor Bowman is thinking. Let me read it to you one more time. While the current stance of monetary policy appears to be restricted, that's the five and a half percent, appears to be doing the job to keep inflation where it's at. That's what she's saying. That will bring inflation down to the two percent over time. So they're thinking the five and a half percent, keep it there long enough. At some point, inflation comes down to two percent. That's all that means, right? Here's what she's saying, though. I remain willing to raise the Fed funds rate at a future meeting should the incoming data indicate that progress on inflation has stalled or reversed. And I would say over the last two months, it's stalled. That's my opinion. You may disagree. But over the last two months, I think inflation, the fight against inflation for, to bring it down has stalled. Bowman said in remarks to New Jersey bankers group that largely focused on their views, on her views about bank regulation and supervision. Bowman, who has been among the more hawkish policymakers in her views on inflation and inflation risk. So when they're saying hawkish, she's one of these folks that are saying, hey, you keep these interest rates higher for longer. I, 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 I don't believe inflation is beat yet. Keep them higher for longer. Matter of fact, I'll even support us raising interest rates. That's hawkish. She believes keep rates higher for longer, no reductions, and if need be, let's jack them up even more. I'm just telling you, that's what she's in favor of. Right? So, Bowman, who has among the more hawkish policymakers in her views on inflation and inflation risk, said she did feel the current benchmark policy rate held at 5.25% to 5.5 range by the Fed since July seemed to be appropriately calibrated to reduce inflationary pressures. A lot of fancy words there. Basically, hey, where we have the interest rate at today, I'm still in favor that it, 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 it's at the right level for now. But again, this lady is not opposed to increasing. And she's not the only one. There's another Fed governor, Waller, who's on the same page as her. So, so, so Fed Chair Powell does not have a consensus. He does not have a uniform, everybody on the same page, everybody want the same thing on his committee right now. I'm just telling you that for a reason, right? Just telling you that for a reason. My baseline, I, she's saying this. My baseline outlook continues to be that inflation will decline further with the policy rate held steady. So, so she's supporting keeping the five and a half percent where it's at, guys. She's not supporting rate cuts right now. So, so yes, we want these rate cuts. And, and, and some people say three. Now people are pulling that back and saying two. Why? Because you have hawkish people on the committee like Fed Governor Bowman who wants rates higher for longer. And like I said, even willing to increase them if need be. Yet, she also noted forces that could push inflation higher. See what I'm saying? Yet, she also noted forces that could push inflation higher, including overseas conflicts that could influence commodity prices. 
Remember, that, remember these little conflicts we got going on around the world with certain countries that I'm not going to mention in this video. But yeah, we got little conflicts all around the world. And she's saying that's going to affect prices of commodities. Right. But also closer to home dynamics like the recent loosening of financial conditions in the U.S. and ongoing high wage growth among U.S. firms. Basically, Shan, basically what she's saying is the labor market is still red hot and people are still getting wages increases. And when people get wage increases, they're not afraid to lose their job because there are plenty of jobs out there. Guess what people do? They keep spending money. And if they keep spending money like there is no tomorrow, guess what inflation is going to do? It's going to stay right where it's at or possibly even go back up slightly like it's did over the last two months. That's basically what she's saying, right? So let's read on and see exactly what else she's thinking. Should the incoming data continue to indicate that inflation is moving substantially toward our 2% goal, it will eventually become appropriate to gradually lower our policy rate to prevent monetary policy from becoming overly restricted. What does she mean there? Recession, right? If they keep rates higher for too long or if they continue to increase rates for too long, it risks the chance of throwing the economy into a recession because what will happen is everything will be so restrictive that people will stop spending altogether. And if they stop spending altogether, then our economy goes into a recession, right? That's basically what she's saying there. Bowman said, in my view, we are not yet at the point. Re reducing our policy rate too soon could result in requiring further future policy rate increases to return inflation to 2% over the long run. Now, this is what you have a Fed governor say, not just her. There's another one out there, too. Fed Governor Waller, basically in the same camp as her. So all I'm telling you is this, guys. The Fed is meeting these two days, and this is what they're going to be discussing. They're going to be looking at the data from the last couple of months. They're going to be looking at the jobs report. They're going to be looking at the CPI inflation report, right, and other data that they collect. They're going to be looking at all of this stuff. And trying to make a determination, what do we want to do with short-term interest rates? Now, I'm going to tell you what's happening. And this is what the market did this morning. And we'll talk about that in a second. Matter of fact, let's dive into that right now. Let, let's see what the market did this morning in anticipation of this two-day meeting. Let's see what the market did. Here's the headline, guys. Stock market today. Dow struggles for direction as attention turns to Fed meeting. So the market this morning, prior to the Fed meeting started, struggled. It struggled. See, stocks mixed early Tuesday as investors hit reverse for a bit. And you know why investors hit reverse, guys? They hit reverse because they're not confident that the Fed is going to reduce rates three times this year. No one's confident of that anymore. Now they're peeling back and saying two times. No one's confident. So when people are not confident and when investors are not confident, when they don't have clarity, when they can't see the future, when they don't know what's down that road, when there is no light at the end of that tunnel that they can see, guess what they do? They panic. They reverse. They start pulling out and moving their money to safety till they have better clarity. That's what you're seeing in the stock market this morning. Let's read. Stocks are mixed. Stocks are in mixed territory Tuesday morning with the Dow in the green while the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq composite are lower, basically lower. In the red, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 129 points or 0.3%. The S&P is off six points. 
the NASDAQ is down 80 points. Is it just treading water ahead of tomorrow's flurry of Fed news? Sure. There's some of that occurring, according to Chief Portfolio Manager Equities at Northwestern Mutual. But after a strong early start in 2024, powered by momentum stocks, Stuckey sees a monetary break in the action. Tuesday morning is showing a little bit of profit taking and some reversal in the momentum trade. So what's happening is some people are saying, OK, we don't have clarity. We don't know exactly what the Fed going to do. We don't know when they're going to reduce short term interest rates. You know something, guys? Let's take some of our profits. Let's just take some of our profits off the table because we don't know what these folks are going to do. And when you got uncertainty like that, guys, the stock market can't flourish. It can't flourish. So you're hearing right now people are either moving money to safety or they're taking profits. And they're taking profits because they, they, they see a reversal coming. So they're thinking, listen, we already hit a home run in these first two months. We don't know what the Fed going to do. We don't want to lose this home run. Let's take some of these profits and, and just enjoy our success for the first two months. And then we'll regroup once we have better clarity on what the Fed going to do with these interest rates. That's what's happening. That is what's happening. But we're going to talk about what that means for you and I. See, I'm talking only about the 1% now. I'm talking about the, the hedge funds, the institutional investors, the billionaire investors. I'm not talking about you and I, what we should be doing. I'm telling you what the 1% are doing. We'll talk about what the 99%ers like us who are trying to build our wealth, what opportunities we have. Just stick in there with me for a second. We'll get to it. One way to see the momentum dynamic at play is in the iShares MSCI US Momentum Factor ETF, he noted. But speaking of watching, Stuckey said the market is desperately trying to see the Fed taking a path towards easing. See what I'm telling you guys? I keep telling you, the market wants clarity. They want the Federal Reserve to come out and plainly spell it out. Listen, America. Listen, world, we're going to be reducing short-term interest rates three times this year, and we're going to start reducing them in June. That's what they want the Fed to say. That's what investors want the Fed to say, but the Fed ain't willing to say that, though. You can see what Fed Governor Bowman, what she, she thinks, and, and Fed Governor Waller, he thinks basically the same thing. But I'm telling you what the, what the, what the market wants they want a path towards easing. And all that means is they want a clear cut path towards when are you going to reduce short term interest rates? If you can't tell us that, then our assets, guys, uh, uh, crypto, stock market, real estate, none of them are going to explode. And, and, and if they keep rates higher for longer or increase rates, they will collapse. They'll collapse. And, and I'm going to run you through some information on real estate that's shocking. I mean, it's shocking. They are on a thin line right now in commercial real estate. If they keep these rates higher or increase these rates, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the commercial real estate market in some sectors. It will totally collapse because we got a lot of commercial real estate loans coming to maturity in 2024 and 2025. A bunch of them. I'm talking about almost three trillion dollars worth. And if these feds do not reduce these rates so that these people who loans are coming due can get a better interest rate. Some of them not going to be able to renew their loans, guys. So let, let's keep reading. And then we're going to dive into some other things here. Just the last little bit on what happened this morning with stocks. Right. Last little bit. There's still a lot of hope the Fed will apply three quarter point cuts this year. It's the only thing saving us right now, guys. That's the only thing saving the market right now. That's the only thing saving the stock market right now is that hope. There's a little glimmer of hope that the Fed will still reduce rates by 
three times, three quarter rate cuts. So about 75 bips, 75 to 100 bips. There's still hope for that. People, investors still are hoping for that. There's a 55% chance they'll do the rate cuts. They'll start the rate cuts by June. That's the only thing saving us right now, but not saving us, but the 99 percenters. I'm sorry, the one percenters, the 99 percenters. You, you got to hear me out on this. Why this is not a bad thing for us. Just hang tight. I'll tell you why in a minute. It's not a bad thing for us if they keep rates higher for longer. It's not a bad thing for us, guys, if they actually increase rates. And I'll tell you why. Last thing here, and then we're going to move on from from this. It was long ago when markets expected the first cut. See, the market in January, guys, in January of 2024, everybody thought the Fed would cut in March, which is right now. This meeting today and tomorrow, they thought the Fed would be cutting. Everybody thought that in January. I, I, I know I went on record to say it. I thought that was going to happen. And that's what this gentleman is saying. It was long ago when it wasn't long ago when markets expected the first cut in March. Now, the hopes of the first cut have been pushed to June or July. And now you understand what's starting to happen, why some institutional investors are starting to take a little bit of cash off the table. Because they're saying to themselves, okay, we crashed and burned on this March thing. We predicted that wrong. Do we want to lose all of our profits from January and February? Or do we want to take the profits now and regroup, come back in this thing, and then these next three months do the same thing, cross our fingers for, for a rate cut? But rate cuts hinge on an economy, a specifically a job market in wages that gets softer, he noted. I don't think there's a whole lot that changes between now and June. So basically, this gentleman right here is saying it all hinges on the, the, the labor market. How soft can the labor market get will determine how fast inflation comes down and will determine when the Fed will reduce short term interest rates. It all hinges on the labor market. What has the labor market done over the last two months? What did it do in January? What did it do in February? In January, we saw initially 353,000 jobs being added to the economy. It was reduced down to 290, but that's still pretty red hot, honestly. Still pretty red hot. What did it do in February? What did it do in February, guys? It came in around 275 jobs added to the economy. Right. Still, still slightly red hot. What did wages do? Sort of ticked up a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. Right. Still over four percent year over year, both months. What did unemployment do? It went from three point seven percent in January to three point nine percent in February. So that is a sign that it is softening somewhat. Does it need to soften further? Yes. And that's what this gentleman is saying. It needs to soften a little bit further. The Fed is saying that it needs to soften a little further. So, so March, April, May, we'll see. Now, all of a sudden, you're way out until June or July for the first Fed cut. Not good, right? Not good at all, guys. Not good at all. Now, Here's a situation what I want to talk about is what's happening with the American people? What's happening with us during this whole thing? And when I say the American, I'm, I'm talking about the 99 percenters because we know the one percenters, they're, they're in a boom economy. We're down here in a bust economy, right? The 99 percenters. But what's happening? First of all, let me, let me just talk about why, what's happening with interest rates and what's going to happen with the stock market, what's going to happen with crypto, um, and we'll save real estate for last. Why for investors like you and I, it's not a bad thing for the Fed to hold interest rates higher for longer. Why isn't it a bad thing for the Fed to increase short-term interest rates in the short time? 
Because guys, when we're in the building stage of wealth, which most of us are, we're trying to buy these really good assets at, at a deep discount. See, the goal is to buy them at a deep discount as, as long as we can buy them. Because where we build our wealth is in the discount. See, the discount is where we build our wealth. That's where we capture our wealth. So if I can go in and buy, you know, an S&P 500 ETF that normally trades at, you know, $65 a share, if I can go buy that ETF at $55 a share or $50 a share, and I can do that over and over and over, knowing that history says that ETF will go back to trade at $65 a share at some point in the future when rates come down, I'm building my wealth. See, I'm buying a $65 a share ETF on sale at $50 a share. So that means to me as an investor, I just made $15 a share on that investment right off the bat because I know history says it's going to go back to that 65 and beyond at some point. So for us who are trying to build wealth, this is perfect. This is perfect. I want to buy NVIDIA. I want to buy Apple. I want to buy Tesla. I want to buy Microsoft. I want to buy Meta, Amazon, Alphabet, the Magnificent Seven. I want to buy them when they're on sale. So yes, keep rates higher for longer. Matter of fact, even increase them. For me, that's a good thing because I know when they increase rates, assets go down. Then I can go in and scoop those assets up at a discount. And then guess what I do? I hold those assets. I hold them. I hold them. I hold them. I hold them until they go back to a premium. At some point in the future, they're going back to a premium when rates come down. When they go back to a premium, now I got a decision to make. Okay, Richard, you bought them at $50 a share. They're worth $70 a share. I can cash out or I can continue to let them compound. Do I believe they get to $90 a share? What does history say? That's how you build wealth, guys, for the 99 percenters. That's why it's not a bad thing if rates go up slightly. It's not a bad thing if they just keep rates at 5.5% for longer, because why? Just what happened this morning. Now, whether it'll work itself like that on, on Wednesday when the Fed actually concludes their meeting and the Federal Reserve chair comes out and gives his comments and gives us direction and, and forward guidance, we don't know what that conversation is gonna be like. That'll be for Wednesday. But for Tuesday morning, the stock market wasn't happy with the direction. So you saw a slight pullback, a slight reversal. I wouldn't say a sell-off, but just a slight reversal. Could we, be, could we see bigger sell-offs on the, tomorrow? Yes, it depends on what the Fed chair says. If the Fed chair comes out with no clear cut pathway to reducing rates, you will see a sell-off tomorrow afternoon or Thursday or Friday, but at some point this week, you'll see a sell-off if there isn't crystal clear clarity when these folks are gonna reduce these interest rates, you're gonna see a slight sell-off. For a guy like me, that's okay, because now I go, I, I go shopping. See, I can go shopping and buy all my favorite assets on sale. I love them when they're on sale because that's where I build my wealth. I build my wealth when they're discounted, heavily. That's why in 2022, I built so much wealth in 2022 because I was buying everything at huge, huge discounts. I don't believe we'll get those discounts again, not, in tw not the 22 discounts, but I think we can get some discounts. If I can buy NVIDIA in the $850 a share range, guys, that's a discount. It traded at $975. If I can buy it in the eights and it's already traded at 975 a couple weeks ago and they're introducing more AI technology that's going to even make them more valuable. I keep telling y'all guys, this is the time to be buying assets and building wealth, man. This is not the time to be on the sideline when it comes to stocks and, and ETFs. Find your favorite companies and, and, and get in the game.
Get in the game. This is not bad news for us. I know a lot of people, oh, that's negative. Oh, the Fed, well, we want them to reduce. I don't want them to do nothing because I want to buy. Oh, I got a 10-year window, man. I got 10 years to double my net worth. And guess what? If I can buy these assets at a discount over the next couple of years and hold them for 10 years, I'm going to build a lot of wealth. So this is not a negative thing for us, guys, if the Fed says, we're going to keep rates at 5.5% for longer. It's not a bad thing for us if they say we got to increase by 25 basis points. Because if they do that, that means all of our favorite assets are going to do what? Go down in value temporarily and we can scoop in, scoop in and buy them at a discount. So I keep telling you guys, don't be negative about this. Don't. Don't look at it as a negative thing. Look at it as a buying opportunity. Look at it as a wealth building opportunity. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about what's going on with Americans and their money. Just, 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 just a little sidebar. So hang in there with me. And then we're going to get to the real 900 pound gorilla, which is commercial real estate. That's we got to talk about that. But we got to talk about this first. Here's the headline, guys. 56 percent of Americans can't afford a thousand dollar emergency expense. We are living in a paycheck to paycheck nation. That's the headline. That is the headline. A majority of Americans say they can't afford a $1,000 emergency expense, according to a recent report from Bank Rate. Only 44% of Americans surveyed said they could use their savings to pay for an unexpected expense. Instead, opting to put it on a credit card or borrow cash from family or friends. Guys, that's not good. That is not a good statistic. That's not a good statistic, guys. That's actually a pretty dang on bad statistic. The, re the reality is that we are unfortunately, essentially living in a paycheck to paycheck nation. Let me halt pause right there for a second. Let me get this straight. I live in the greatest country in the world. Number one economy. Our dollar is the world's reserve currency. More billionaires in this country than any other country in the world. We have the best companies in the world. But yet and still, 56% of our citizens don't have $1,000 to pay for an emergency, an unexpected emergency. Help me out with that, guys. Help me out, chat. How can that be? What, what causes that? What causes the greatest country in the world, the number one economy in the world, more billionaires than any other country in the world? Why is 56% of its citizens can't afford a $1,000 unexpected expense? Help me out with that, chat. Somebody help me out with that. We're a consumer-based society where people are implored on a constant basis to spend their money. And the messaging is not nearly as strong with respect to saving money. I've always told you guys, we are a nation of spenders, not savers or investors. Why is that? Who benefits from us being a nation of spenders? Can somebody in the chat tell me who benefits from that? Who benefits from if the masses, even though we got the greatest financial economy in the world, we got more billionaires than anybody in the world. Why is it that we're a nation of spenders and not savers and investors? Who benefits from that? Y'all think about that. Who, who benefits from that? Who, who, who benefits from 
the messaging. See, you, you heard what they said. Let me just read that one more time because I thought that was really, really good. We're a consumer-based society where people are implored on a constant basis to spend their money. And the messaging is not nearly as strong with respect to saving money. Haven't you noticed when you watch television, when you watch um, scrolling through your phone and you're looking at your little feed, haven't you noticed the number of commercials and ads you get for you to actually spend money? You really get any that says you should be saving money. Have you noticed that? Have you ever watched one of your favorite sitcoms or one of your favorite drama shows on TV and all the commercials that come on? Have you noticed you, 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 you really never get anything about, hey, you watching this TV show, you know 56% of people live paycheck, don't have $1,000. You know 62% of people live paycheck. You don't never get that kind of commercial, do you? Do you ever see that kind of commercial? Never. No. Only commercials you really see are you buying something. You spending your money to buy something. That's all you see. You never see a commercial. Hey, guys. Hey, emergency. Emergency. Uh, we live in paycheck to paycheck in this, in this country. 56% of people don't have $1,000 for unexpected. You don't see that. You don't see that. Why don't you see it? Because mainstream media is controlled by the 1%. And, and, and who benefits from us being a country of spenders? The 1% benefits, guys. That's who benefits. Unexpected economic events that occurred in quick succession over the past five years from the fallout over the pandemic to high finances of American families. It's quite remarkable in the current environment that even with low unemployment, see, this is what I'm trying to tell you guys, man. Y'all got to understand what's going on in this country and who controls everything. I keep telling y'all the 1% control everything. Listen to this right here. This is, this is a good one. Listen to this right here. It's quite remarkable in the current environment that even with low unemployment and a job market, that has been both robust and resilient in recent years that we still have this remarkably low percentage of Americans who could pay this emergency expense. <laughs> Listen, man, since the pandemic broke out, they gave everybody free money, pretty much everybody, right? If you own a business, you got PPP, right? If you didn't own a business and you got fired, you got unemployment. You also got stimulus checks. We ran up our personal savings to about $2 trillion because everybody was shut in. Nobody wouldn't go out. They had to shut the country down. Everybody took their little money and they hoarded it, right? As soon as they opened up the country again, we took that $2 trillion and just blew through it in two years. We got right back on the hamster wheel. Blew through it in two years. And this guy is basically saying, isn't it incredible that we live in the greatest country in the world? Number one economy in the world. More billionaires than anywhere in the world. Number one job market in the world. Two jobs for every one candidate. Wages through the roof. But yet and still, 56% of our citizens don't even have $1,000 for an unexpected emergency. 62% of our citizens live in paycheck to paycheck. Crazy guys, crazy, crazy stuff, crazy stuff, crazy. No matter how much you have saved up, economic conditions make now an ideal time to focus on building your emergency fund savings. How many times I haven't told y'all that? How many times do we talk about the four financial principles you should be living by? How many times we've, you, you've seen me do videos on that? And, and, and y'all wonder, some of y'all wonder why, why, why you do the same videos all the time? That's why. See, people don't really get it until you just pound it in day in and day out. Then some of y'all start getting it. You know, that's why I do the videos I do and I do them in the format I do them in, guys. 
because we don't understand the basic stuff we need to understand in this country. Even though we got the richest country, the most wealthiest country in the world, 99% of the citizens don't participate in it. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. 99% of us don't even can participate in any of the upside. Only thing we participate in is the downside. That's why the videos I make are repetitive. See, some of y'all out here think I'm an entertainer. Oh, I'm here to entertain you. No, I'm not. I'm not here to entertain you. I don't care anything about entertaining you. I'm here to give you some education that can help, help you be able to afford a $1,000 unexpected emergency. Help you get your emergency fund together. Help you start living on less than what you make. Help you get out of credit card debt. And then help you save and invest. That's the goal here. Those four things. Get you living on less than what you make. Get your living on a plan, which is a personal budget. Keep you out of consumer debt and then start saving and investing. Those are the four financial principles, guys. And they're going to be you're going to hear them over and over and over on this channel because of this right here. Exactly what this guy just said. No matter how much you have saved up economic conditions, make now an ideal time to focus on building up your emergency fund. How many of y'all got a three to six month emergency fund tucked away right now? Three to six months of your expenses. How many of you guys have an emergency fund now? I'm not talking about uh, your 401k. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a real emergency fund. Three to six months of your expenses. So if you were to hit a financial bump in the road, you could survive for six months on that money you got tucked away over there. How many? That's the question you got to ask yourself, guys. Do you have an emergency fund? Why now is a good time to save? Nearly a decade of low interest rates followed by a period of high inflation and Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes have created an environment that is beneficial for those shopping around for high yield savings products. Now, again, that's where the emergency fund should go and a high yield savings product. But that high yield savings product is not gonna get you to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's for your savings. That's for your emergency fund. To get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you're gonna need more than a 3% return on your money. You're gonna need more than a 4% return on your money for most of us. We're gonna, lead, we're gonna need at least an 8% return on our money in order to get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And your high yield money market or your high yield savings account ain't going to give you that. It's never going to give you that. So listen, I agree with this person in this article when it comes to your high yield savings account and your money market account. Yes, that should be where you keep short term money. Your emergency fund. Or if you got something that you got to take care of financially within the next 12 months, you keep that in the money market fund. But for the long term money that you need to be putting in assets that can compound at least an 8% rate of return on an annual basis over a period of time, that don't need to be in your money market account if you ask me. That's my opinion. I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. But I'm just telling you from experience, 25 years of experience, you set yourself up for failure. If you're in the building stage of wealth, you should have a combination of the two. I should have some short-term instruments and I gotta have long-term instruments. See, my short-term interest instruments are for my short-term needs, right? That's my emergency fund, just in case I get sick, I get hurt, I can't work. That might be to pay for something for my child that's gonna be upcoming in the next year. It may be a down payment on a house that I've been saving up to buy me a house. Don't put that in the stock market, guys. Don't put anything in the stock market that you need within the next 12 to 24 months. Don't put it in there. Keep it in your high yield money market. What goes in the stock market, in my opinion, is money that you are putting in the stock market so it can grow over time. When I say over time, I'm talking about three years to 10 years or longer. That money, I'm okay putting in the stock market. 
Why am I putting it in the stock market? Because I need at least an 8% rate of return on average so that I can build wealth like I need to build wealth in order for that wealth to generate income for me at some point in the future. Not today. Oh, how many dividends can I get? No, you can't get much dividends with that $1,000 you invested. You're going to get pennies. So don't worry about no dividends right now when you're broke. Worry about dividends when you got a quarter of a million dollars in, in your stock market account, when you got half a million dollars in your stock market account, when you got a million dollars in your stock market, then worry about some dividends. Right now, when you're putting you know, $500, $1,000 in your brokerage account and, and you're buying a few, don't worry about no dividends, guys. You ain't getting no dividends. And if you do get them, they're going to be pennies. See, dividends are there when you build wealth. That's the, then you turn on the dividend. Then you turn on the income. But you got to build the wealth first. You got to have a large enough amount of wealth before dividends to make sense. Right. Got to have a large amount of wealth for that to make sense. So that's about it. I, I'm not going to go into any more of that in this. And I just wanted to share that with you. I wanted to share that bit of information with you. How, how Americans are struggling. Greatest country in the world. Number one economy in the world. Number one job market in the world. World's reserve currency, the dollar. Everybody transacts business in the, in the dollar. Why? Because they trust America. They trust the financial strength of America. But yet still, yet and still, 50% of our, 56% of Americans cannot afford a $1,000 unexpected expense. Come on, guys. We got to start getting this stuff. We got to start understanding what's going on in this country and who benefits from us being. And I'm sorry, guys, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but who benefits from us being financially illiterate? Who benefits? Who benefits from us being financially illiterate? Who benefits? That's all you got to ask yourself. Who benefits, who benefits from me being dependent on family members on my credit card if I got any uh, limits left? That's my emergency fund is my family and my credit cards. Who benefits from me living that type of financial life? No one should live like that. Everybody should be able to dig into their emergency fund or their savings and pull out a thousand bucks and pay for if you need a new alternator. Or, or, or if your kid need to, you know, whatever. You, you, we all should be financially more well off to do that in the greatest country in the world. How can you be the greatest country in the world when 99% when of your citizens living down here in the bust economy? Only 1% of the citizens living in the boom economy. 99% of your citizens in the matrix. It's crazy to me. Now let's go ahead and move on to real estate. And then we're going to button this thing up and get out of here. Let's move on to real estate. And, and guys, this is important. So a lot of y'all, oh, what do I need to know about commercial real estate? That don't affect me. Oh, yeah, it does. Oh, yeah, it does. Because once you figure out, when I read through this article and tell you who, where they get the money from in order to give to these commercial uh, uh, loan clients, where these banks get the money from, you'll pay attention. It comes from you. The money that they got in these real estate loans for, for these, this almost $3 trillion worth of real estate, that's your money. That's your money, guys. The money that you put into your bank, that's what they do with it. They put it in stuff like this so that they can make money. So, yeah, you should pay attention because I guarantee you, your little bank that you're dealing with, probably in this little package of banks that are going to be in trouble here in a little bit if these interest rates don't come down. Here's the headline. High interest rates and commercial real estate debt have regional banks in a pressure cooker. And expiring loan program could turn up the heat. And, and we'll, I'll, I'll tell you what that expired. It already expired, by the way. High interest rates have already destroyed some two trillion in asset value. See, y'all don't believe me when I be telling y'all this, guys. I told y'all interest rates control asset values. I, I, I've been telling y'all that. 
Right here, I'm just reading it for you again so that y'all, some of y'all think I'm just, I'm out here just being a lunatic and just saying all kind of crazy stuff. No, I'm not. You got to understand, guys, I was in the banking industry for 25 years. I was a commercial banker for 25 years. I know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not saying I'm some genius or some expert, but I, I've, I've been in the banking business a long time. So, so, so what I'm reading here is no foreign concept to me. It, it makes sense because I know exactly what they're saying. Let me just read this one more time. High interest rates have already destroyed some $2 trillion in asset value. Destroyed it. So that means $2 trillion down the drain in value on some of this commercial real estate. And guess who going to be holding that bag at the end of the day? You. So let me read on. I'm going to let me read on and I'm going to wrap it all up for you and show you how you're going to be left holding the bag if you're not careful. High interest rates and the commercial real estate market are weighing in on the economy. And when a short term federal loan program expires on March 11th, which had already expired. They could weigh even heavier on regional banks. A lot of what's been going on is people didn't want to recognize how serious the problem was. But now it's becoming pretty obvious, right? Regional banks hold more than two thirds of roughly 2.8 trillion, I told y'all almost $3 trillion. Regional banks hold more than two thirds of the roughly 2.8 trillion in outstanding loans for U.S. commercial real estate properties. Why does, that make, why does that matter to you? Because a lot of you guys hold your money in regional or community banks or credit unions. Most of, a lot of y'all hold your money there. Okay, let me take my check and put it in my checking account. It's safe. Oh, let me put it in my, my high-yield money market. Bank take that money when you go ahead and deposit it. The bank takes it and they give it to folks like this so that they can get an interest rate. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. And according to the National Association of Realtors, the historically low vacancy rates, even throughout 2023, aren't expected to reverse themselves any time soon. A professor at Columbia Business School noted that everyone was playing the waiting game, hoping interest rates would soon fall. But with the latest consumer price index, CPI inflation report, showing inflation still above 3%, it is unlikely that the Federal Reserve will approve rate cuts in March. Oh, they're not. They're not. Nope, nope, nope. Not, not happening in March. I, I, who knows? May not happen in June, guys. Better prepare yourself. Prepare for the worst. Expect the best. I keep telling you. Prepare yourself. Don't get rug pulled. Don't get yourself rug pulled because I'm telling you right now, it's a possibility. High rates have already destroyed about two trillion in asset value for banks. So let me make sure I got this straight here. I go into my bank. I put my money into my bank. I'm thinking my money is safe. I'm thinking I'm good. I go home, go on about my business. My bank take my money. Go lend it to somebody in the form of a loan, right? They start collecting interest on that loan. They start collecting principal. And the principal belongs to who? Me. See, the bank gets the interest. The principal belongs to me because it's my money. Problem is, they're not giving me that much of the interest. But they use 100% of my money to collect interest for them. Right? So what happens, though, when $2 trillion dollars an asset value goes down. And that property is not worth what it was when they originally did the loan. Who eats that loss? Let's keep reading. We'll figure out who eats it. Let's just keep reading here. Let's keep reading. High rates have already destroyed about $2 trillion in asset value for banks. Right? Mm 
Mm -mm -mm. Which takes a closer look at the number of properties where outstanding debts exceed listed values. See what I'm saying? I remember I just said that a few seconds ago. What happens, guys, is this is what it, this is how it works. Come into the bank. Let's say I'm a commercial real estate investor. I buy commercial real estate properties. I put tenants in those properties. So I come into the bank and say, okay, bank, listen here. I'm a real estate investor. I got this retail center over here. It has 50,000 square feet. It's fully leased. I got an anchor tenant, and then I got all these little bitty junior tenants. Cash flow is murder. Okay, all right, Richard, let's, let's look at the cash flow. Bank looks at the cash flow, does an appraisal on the property, it's full of tenants, everything looks great. Okay, boom, we're gonna give you this loan. The interest rate is gonna be 4.5%, but it's only gonna be for five years. See, with commercial real estate lending, there ain't no 30-year fixed rate mortgage. No, that don't exist. So what do they do? They give them a five-year loan with a five-year fixed interest rate. Problem is, now that five-year loan in 2024 and 2025 are coming due. Remember, they got a 4.5% rate the first time. It was, it was sweet. Unfortunately, with the Fed keeping rates at 5.5%, that's the Fed funds rate, this rate right here at 4.5% no longer exists. It's 7.5% now. So now you got a 3% interest rate jump in your loan payment. Remember when we first did the loan, you had 100% occupancy. Problem is now, you only have about 65% occupancy. Some of your little mom and pop tenants dipped on you. They left. Hit hard times, couldn't afford to rent. Guess what? If I'm a plumber and I got one of your 2,000 square foot spaces and I'm paying you, you know, $5,000 a month for it and I hit hard times, guess what I'm going to do as a plumber? I'm going to go run my plumbing business out of my own house. I don't need your property no more. I'll park my trucks at my own house. Or my workers take your truck home with you. We'll see you on the job tomorrow. I ain't got to pay you that $5,000 in rent no more. So that's what's happening to these, some of these, these commercial real estate owners. Some of their tenants are not renewing their leases. Why? Why aren't tenants renewing their leases? You know why? Because interest rates are super high and most small businesses borrow money to fund their growth. And if they can't go to their local bank and borrow money, just like the commercial real estate guy borrows money, guess what? They got to cut expenses somewhere. And the first thing they're going to cut is what? Your rent. Because I can run my, my business at my own house. I don't need this building. I can say that's $60,000 a year. Put that back in my business. Run it from home. That's what's happening with these commercial real estate guys, whether it be office space, retail space. Those are the two big ones. That's what's happening. So what happens is when you did that loan five years ago, it had 100% occupancy. See, your value of your building, guys, when it comes to commercial real estate lending, when it comes to commercial real estate in particular, the value is driven by what? The lease income. It's the lease income that drives the value, not just the building itself sitting there. No, it's the rental income. The more rental income you have for that property, typically the higher the value for the property because it's generating income. But what happens is, is when you lose tenants, that income comes down. And if your value is associated with the income produced from the property and your income goes down, guess what happens to your property value? It goes down. That's what's starting to happen right now, guys. These guys are coming in, these gals and these, these companies, whoever own the commercial real estate are coming into the bank and saying, hey, I know my loan coming due. And I know the only thing you can renew me for is like a seven and a half percent rate. The problem is when the bank goes back to reappraise that property to reaffirm a new rate, property value is down. And what they're saying in the tune of two trillion dollars in decline property values. And that's because of the rental income is down. So now what does the bank have to do? Bank stuck between a rock and a hard place. I got a property 
that won't cash flow because I don't have enough rental income coming in because there ain't 100 percent tenants in there anymore. He got 65 percent worth of tenants in there. So now the property don't cash flow at the seven and a half percent interest rate. It don't cash flow. So the bank is either make something work with this guy or gal or worst case scenario. They come in and say, hey, go to keys. Y'all can have it. I can't pay it. I'll try to put it up for sale, but y'all got to take a haircut. Yeah, well, when you did the loan, I had 100% occupancy. The building was worth $5 million. Now I only got 65% occupancy. The building, the building is worth $3.5 million. But you owe us $4.5 million, Mr. Richard Fain. You owe us $4.5 million on a $5 million loan. But now you're telling us the building is only worth $3.5 million. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you because I don't have 100% occupancy no more. Who's taking that haircut? Where did they get the money to lend that guy that $5 million to buy that building? They got it from you, your deposits. This is how these regional banks are starting to get in trouble because just multiply that by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of real estate loans come and due. Thousands of real estate loans come and due. That's how these regional banks are getting in trouble. So if your money is in a regional bank, you better make sure they're, they're, they're solid. They're on solid ground. And you better take a look at the real estate portfolio and see what's coming due. Because what this article is saying, it ain't pretty. This article is basically saying it's not pretty. Their research shows that currently about 14% of all CRE loans and 44% of all office loans are high risk of default. And if that default rate were to reach 20% or 380 banks could be at risk of insolvency. They're saying, let me read this for you guys who got your money in these regional banks and these small banks. See, I ain't talking about your, your big boy, too big to fail banks. I ain't talking about them. I'm talking about these little mom and pop banks, these little regional banks who only make most of their money from loans. See, these big boy, too big to fail banks like Wells, J.P. Morgan, Wachovia. I'm not Wachovia, but um, Bank of America. Those guys, they got hundreds of ways of making money, not just commercial real estate. Right. They got trading desks. They got the general bank. They got they got. I think the last time I checked, Wells Fargo had like 85 different lines of business of ways to make money. Wells Fargo, but like 85 lines of making business. These regional banks, guys, these small community banks, they don't have that. They make the most of their money off loans. So if loans go bad, their revenue dries up, their income source dries up. And that's how they fail. Let me read this one more time. Their research shows that currently about 14% of CRE loans, that's commercial real estate loans, and 44% of all office loans, that means all other type of loans, are at high risk of default because of what? These high interest rates and these loans coming to maturity and they're going to reset at higher interest rates, which affects the cash flow which affects the, 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 the loan, the borrower's ability to repay the loan, right? They're saying if it gets to 20%, over 380 banks would be at risk of insolvency. That basically means their liabilities exceed their assets. And when you look at banks, guys, somebody tell me in the chat, what does a deposit for a bank represent on their balance sheet? What does a deposit for a bank represent? When you're looking at a bank's balance sheet, what does a deposit represent on that balance sheet? Bingo. Somebody in the chat just jumped in. It's a liability, guys. See, your deposit is a liability because why? Why? If you walk in there and tell the bank you want your money, they got to give it back to you. It's not theirs. So it's a liability on their balance sheet. Somebody tell me what does a loan represent on a bank's balance sheet? 
What does a loan represent? What does a loan represent on a bank's balance sheet? Bingo, it's an asset. A loan on a bank's balance sheet is an asset. Why? Because it, what, what does assets do, guys? Tell me what does an asset do, typically, or what it should do. It puts money in your pocket. See, loans, since the bank can charge an interest rate, they use your money. This is, this is I told y'all guys, we got the greatest country in the world, boy. We got some, we got some, woo, we got some good stuff in this country. They take your money. This is what the bank does. They take your deposits, which they don't own, <laughs> which you own. It's your money. They take your money. They lend it to somebody in the form of a loan and create an asset. They take your money and they create an asset, which is a loan. And that asset, that loan has an interest rate attached to it. That's the income stream. So it is a asset on a bank's balance sheet. Your deposits are a liability because they don't own them and they take money out of the bank's pocket because some of those deposits, they have to pay you interest like your high yield money mark. That's why y'all, that's why you notice guys, think about it. You notice your big boy, too big to fail banks for the general population. I'm talking about 99 percenters, not your one percenters, but your 99 percenters at the big boy, too big to fail banks, they don't pay you any interest on your deposits, really. Not you and I. Now, if some guy got $100 million in their bank, they'll pay him some interest. But you and me, with our little bit of two cents we put in their bank, they're not going to pay us no interest. But yet and still, the big boy, too big to fail banks will take your deposits, they'll move them over here, and guess what they'll do with them? They'll invest them. Not just in loans, guys. They will take your money and invest it offshore overnight, bring it back every morning. Take it over offshore, invest it, make money off your money while you sleeping. You ain't getting no money made off your money while you sleeping. The bank take your money while you sleeping. The big boy too big to fail banks. They take your money while you sleeping and they invest it in an overnight sweep. And then they bring it back the next morning. <laughs> Man, I'm trying to tell y'all, man, these banks, these banks, man, I'm telling you, if I, if I had to recreate myself, I'd, I'd start me a bank. It, it's the biggest scam in, in the history of scams along with crypto. Crypto and the banks are the two biggest scams on the American people I've seen in my lifetime. Banks and crypto. Dumb two right there, man, are the two biggest scams. You go into the bank with your money. And they take your money and they lend it out and make money. And then when it collapses, they don't have to pay you back. The government steps in and pays you back, not the bank. FDIC insurance steps in and pays you back, not the bank. They don't pay you nothing back. They, well, we failed. So my point is this. With these regional banks and these small banks, please, guys. Take a look at who you got your banking with. Make sure these people are on solid ground. Because if they're not, the likelihood that they fall into this scenario right here of these 380 banks that could be in trouble, if that default rate gets up to 20%, it's not going to be good, man. It's not going to be good. All of this comes as the Federal Reserve has announced that it won't be extending the bank term funding program. And all that was was a program that the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, I believe that's what it's called, they put together this program to help banks borrow, to let banks borrow money from them at a cheap, cheap, cheap discount so that they wouldn't fail. See, a lot of these regional banks found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place because they had taken your deposits and put them in shady investment deals. And then y'all started coming in asking for your money. They didn't have it. It was in shady deals or it happened to what happened to some of the real estate values. Remember, two trillion dollars in real estate asset value declined. Right. So if so, if they took one hundred million dollars of your money, 
depositors' money. They took $100 million. And let's say they took that $100 million and they put it into a two-year treasury bond. They put it into a two-year treasury bond. And let's say when they put that money into that two-year two treasury bond, the interest rate was 2%, right? They were getting 2%, 3%, whatever they were getting. See, here's how it works, though. Here's how it works. If you want to cash that treasury bond in early, you got to go to the secondary market. And there has to be somebody that's willing to buy that from you at face value. That's how, that's how it works. You buy a treasury bond, but it has a maturity. It could be a two-year maturity, five-year maturity, 10-year maturity. Now, if you hold that treasury bond to full maturity, you get all your money back. You get all your principal back. But here's what's happening, though. See, here's what's happening. Some of these banks took large amounts of money, guys, and they put it in these treasury bonds. Two-year maturity, five-year maturity, thinking everything's great. All of a sudden, trouble hits. Interest rates go sky high, right? All of a sudden, their, their, their loans that they did start going sideways. But all of your deposits are tied up in these loans and in these treasury bonds, right? That's where all the deposits are. But remember, they take your deposits to make money. It's the only way they make money is with your deposits. So they take all of your deposits, or as much as they can, they put them in loans and they put them in other investments like treasury bonds. The problem is when the loans start going bad, they start getting bad press. You started coming in saying, no, I want my money. Problem is your money is tied up in a two year treasury bond. Right. Let's say 100 million bucks. It's tied up in a two year treasury bond. Now, in order for them to get that 100 million bucks out of that two year treasury bond before maturity, they have to, they have to find somebody to buy it from them. Problem is they can't find nobody to buy it at face value. Everybody wants a discount. No, we can't give you face value of 100 million. We'll give you 800. We'll, we'll, 100 million, we'll give, you, we'll give you 75 million. So now you got a $25 million haircut. Where does that money come from? It's gone because they didn't hold it to maturity. They had to sell it on the secondary bond market for a discount just to get out of the deal. The problem is you got to multiply that and, 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 and say a billion dollars. Maybe they got two billion dollars in that two year treasury. And, and, and they got to take a two hundred million dollar haircut. Now, it, 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 so, so my point is, that's how these little small banks and these regional banks get in trouble. When interest rates go up, they get in trouble. See, they get in trouble because interest rates are, are, are up. And they're staying up. See, the, see, see, if I'm looking for a treasury bond, I'm going to say to myself, why in the world would I pay you face value for a 2% treasury bond for two years when I can go buy a brand new one at 4.5%? So, 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 so you, you, you don't really have a, a, a buyer for it unless you discount it. You got to discount that thing to make it attractive for someone to buy it for them. Because if I'm looking at both of them and I'm saying, okay, this is a 2% rate on a two-year, or I can get a brand new two-year for four and a half, which one do you think I'm going to take? I'm going to take the four and a half, unless you heavily discount the two and a half. So it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare for these little regional banks, man. And, and I'm asking you guys to make sure you go double check to find out what's going on with your bank. I'm not saying pull your money out of there and do all this stuff. I'm just telling you to go check them out. Go ask some questions. For some of y'all, y'all scared to go in there and ask questions. It's your money, guys. If I'm not comfortable with where my money is at, I'm going to move it. It's my money. You got to be comfortable. I'm telling you what this article is saying. You guys got to be, that, 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 that bank term funding program ended March 11th. And when it ended, guess how much money was still owed to that program? About $164 billion. Banks still owed to that program that they haven't paid back yet. Just telling you, man, y'all better be careful out there. All of this comes in the Federal Reserve. All of this comes as the Federal Reserve has announced that they won't be extending the bank term funding program, a short term liquidity option for banks established in March of 2023 in the wake of the Silicon Valley bank crisis. Silicon Valley Bank failed for that very reason I just walked you through. 
Go look, at the, go look up Silicon Valley Bank and figure out why they failed. Exactly what I just told you, that's why they failed. They had customer deposits wrapped up in all these crazy investments. There was a run on the bank where basically everybody came in at one time wanting their money and they didn't have it. And when that happens, guess what? FDIC has to come in, shut the bank down, dismantle the whole bank, sell it off to whoever will buy it, and you keep moving. That's what happens. A lot of what they tried to do after the SVB collapse was to create a perception that they, to an extent, will bank the backing system. It's a confidence game at the end of the day, and he's right. See, they don't want you guys going out there doing a run on these banks because if you do, it will cripple our entire financial system. Let's just be honest. The, the, the whole financial system is a, is, a, is, a, is a house of cards that they use you for everything. That's, that's what supports this financial system in this country. It's a house of cards. So they can afford for you guys, me included, to go to these banks and start demanding every dime they owe us. They don't have it, guys. <laughs> they don't have it. The money is tied up out here doing crazy stuff because that's how they make money. They take your money to make money. So they don't want a bank run. So what do they do? They give you this illusion that they got your back. Everything's perfect, which they do. The federal government just steps in and prints money. That's all. But that's the reason we're in the predicament we're in now with interest rates, because that's what we did at the pandemic. We just stepped in after the pandemic, during the pandemic, we stepped in and pumped a lot of money into free money into the system that we knew at some point we would have to extract out of the system in order to get back to an equilibrium. They knew that, but they did it anyways, because if they didn't do it, the whole house of cards would have fell down. Everything is supported, guys, by us, the 99 percent. They use us for everything. And they pump in this propaganda through mainstream media to keep us basically financially illiterate so that we don't figure this out for ourselves. But they use us for everything. This whole financial system in this country is based upon fleecing us. That's what it's based on. It's based upon fleecing you and me out of every dime we make. And then they throw Social Security at us at the end of the day to say thank you. That's the game plan. The game plan is for you to think you own everything, but in actuality, you own nothing. That's the game plan. And, and, and they've been successful based on what I've just told you today. They've been very successful at it. 56% 50 per, of Americans can't afford a $1,000 unexpected expense. They are very good at what they do, guys. The 1% are very good at what they do. That's why I tell you guys, if you want to change something in your financial life, you got to stop supporting the 1% and making them more wealthy. You got to start taking this money and putting it in assets to make you wealthy. You just have to understand this whole thing in this country from our financial system is predicated on fleecing you. It's predicated on taking advantage of you financially. I just told you what the banks do. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. This is ridiculous what the banks do. I mean, it's ridiculous. And I, and I was a part of the system. So I, 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 I must admit, I, I, I was part of that system for 25 years. So I know exactly what they do. I know exactly what they do. And I know exactly how they look at these real estate properties. And see, that's why I'm telling you at some point, the Fed got to reduce interest rates because if they don't, the banking system, I'm talking about these small, medium-sized banks are going to be in trouble because they got all kind of risky, shady assets out here that, that thrive when interest rates are low. When these interest rates are high, these little shady assets that a lot of these regional banks, even the big boy too... Even the big boy, too big to fail banks got shady assets out there, too. They got shady shenanigans that we pay for. And, and, and this and this um, this um, bank term funding program that, that that is still owed one hundred and sixty four billion dollars. Guess who underwrites that? It's 
Somebody in the chat tells me who underwrites that. Who, who will underwrite that $164 billion that's owed uh, to the bank term funding program? Who underwrites that $164 billion at the end of the day? Who, matter of fact, somebody tell me in the chat who underwrites all of this crap at the end of the day when the government do all this crazy stuff with the money. They, 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 they protect these big boy too big to fail banks, all of that. Who underwrites all of that? Who pays for all of that at the end of the day? Bingo, taxpayers, <laughs> you and me. <laughs> I told y'all guys, this is the greatest Ponzi scheme, the greatest scam in the history of scams. What we got going on, man, it's just crazy. The American people, we pay for all this stuff through taxes. They underwrite this, all these failed banks come through our taxes. It's paid for it by our taxes. Everything is paid for by our taxes. We underwrite all of this stuff. We underwrite it all. We pay for it all. But yet and still, we don't even have a thousand dollars to take care of an unexpected expense. Not even a thousand bucks. I tell you what, guys. I, I couldn't live the rest of my financial life that way. I had to figure out a way to transition from being in the matrix. I had to figure out a way to transition from being a matrix to getting over here. Now, guys, let, let, let me make sure I'm clear on this because I don't want to have no, no misunderstandings here. Let me make sure I'm clear on something. That way, there are no misunderstandings. I just want to make sure I'm clear on something. I'm a proud American. I still believe we have the greatest country in the world and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in this world other than the United States. That doesn't mean I don't want to go somewhere else and live in, in, in different parts of the world at some point in my life, but I'll always be an American and I'll always have a home here in America, always. This is my country and I love my country. But the fact is, there's 1% of the population that controls 99% of the wealth. That's the tr that's a fact. That's a fact. And they manipulate the 99%, right? See, the 99% basically support the 1% through what? Spending, through our economy. See, our whole economy is based on the 99% spending every dime. That doesn't mean you don't have a good life. That don't mean you don't have nice things. That don't mean you don't do take nice trips. That don't mean you don't send your kid to private school. That don't mean you don't have some of the, you eat at some of the finest restaurants in the world. It don't mean that. That's the trap though. See, that's the trap. See, because they got you thinking, really, it's all about that stuff. Long as they got you thinking it's all about stuff, he who has the most stuff is the most successful. Long as they got you thinking that way, then you won't worry about building no assets. Because see, the real wealth is in the assets. That's what a real wealth is. The real wealth is in the assets that actually generate income, that increase in value and generate income. That's the real wealth. Over here, they don't want you understanding that. They want you to think the real wealth is in your car that you buy, the house that you live in, you know, how many watches you got, how much designer clothes you got, you know, how many fancy trips you take, you know, how, 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 you know, where do you send your kid to school? You see, that's what they want you to think. They, they want you to think that's where the wealth is. And that's not where the wealth is. That's the trap. That's the trap to keep you on that treadmill, to keep you on that hamster wheel. That's the trap to keep you in the rat race, to keep you working hard, grinding, making all this money to keep up with what? The Joneses. They want you in the matrix trying to keep up with the Joneses so that you think that's the real wealth. So that's the real success, but it's not. The real success is over here where assets are that generate income. That's where the real wealth is. All I'm trying to get you to understand is here are all the cards on the table. Still the greatest country in the world. Still would not live anywhere else other than America. Still am a proud American. But you got to understand how the how the, deck, the, the, the deck is stacked against you. 
You got to understand, they're not telling you this, but they got, they got a lot of cards in there that you don't know about. You, you, ever, you ever played poker or, 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 or blackjack? And the dealer, you see, we are the guy sitting across the table from the dealer. The 1% is the dealer. It, it's, the, it's the casino. See, the 1% represent the dealer in the casino. The odds are stacked in their favor. So when I sit down at that, that blackjack table, not only am I at a disadvantage, but hell, they got they the casino. They, they know all the probabilities of what I'm going to do. They, they know it down to, they have, a, they have it all the way down to a science. This guy walks in here, he has $10,000 to bet. We know if we can keep him in this chair long enough, he'll lose it all. See, they know that. Why do you think casinos exist? Why do you think now ESPN and all the rest of these, all of a sudden now the NFL is in cahoots with gambling. When did that happen? <laughs> Y'all ain't paying attention, man, to what's going on right here, bro. Pay attention. How in the world you, you going to penalize one of your players for betting on NFL games, but you are in cahoots with the gambling casinos? You in cahoots with them. How in the world can you penalize somebody for gambling on something when you support gambling? I mean, what is going on with the NFL? I know I digress and I'm all over the place, guys, but I'm just trying to get y'all to understand what's happening in this country. See, if you know the rules to the game, if you know the plays, you get to get in the game and participate. 1% is the casino and the dealer. You are the guy or the gal sitting across from them, and they know if they can distract you long enough with the free drinks, the sexy women and people walking through, you know, the, the noise of the slot machines and all. Let me give you a show. Let me comp you a beautiful room. See, they know if they can distract you long enough and keep you there long enough, they win. And that's simply what's happening here with the 1%. They know if they can distract you with the commercials, they can distract you with the buy this and buy that. This is where your real wealth is. This is what makes you successful. You got to have the big house. You got to have three or four cars. You got to have blah, 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 blah. They can distract you with this. They'll keep you from building wealth. And that's where the real gold is. That's where the real gold is, guys. So all I got to tell you guys is pay attention this week to what's going on with the Fed. I don't think we're going to get much out of this meeting other than, you know, what we get. We're not going to get a reduction in interest rates. We're not going to get an increase in interest rates. They're going to just steady the ship right where it's at. They're not going to do anything. They're going to leave rates at five and a half percent. I don't think they're going to give any clear guidance or any clear forward thinking. I don't think they're going to get any clarity about when they're going to reduce rates. I don't think so. So I, 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 but we'll see tomorrow. So I'm going to be tuned in tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 p.m. to hear the, 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 the Fed chair, Jay Powell, do his little presentation and, and see what happens with that. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Well, guys, I hope you got something out of this information. I, I think it's critical that we understand how this financial market works and, and what's at stake and who are the players and who, who, who is trying to manipulate us and control us. That's my whole key here with today's message was, Understand who's trying to manipulate you and control you. Understand who the players are. Understand what's at stake here. Your financial freedom is at stake. So grab a hold of it. You control it, not them. Take your money, put it in assets that build wealth and create passive income. That's how you get yourself off that hamster wheel. That's how you get yourself out of that rat race. If you want up to 15 free stocks, guys, go down to the description box. Moo moo is gonna give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. You put $100 in that new Moomoo Moo brokerage account, they're gonna give you five free stocks. If you put $1,000 in that Moomoo Moo brokerage account, they're gonna give you 15 free stocks. Now, it is a limited time offer. It don't last forever, guys. So if you're interested in taking advantage of that particular offer, don't delay. Act today. Get started today. Get down there in that description box and click on that Moomoo Moo link Open up your Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. 
And guys, I'm going to send you my wealth transfer blueprint. I'm going to give you my three big boy blue chip paper assets that I'm going to be buying over the next 10 years that I believe will double my net worth. And I'm going to be buying them through the Moo Moo brokerage app. So if you want to rock with me and you want to know what my blueprint to success is, especially with paper assets, send me an email. Go down to my description box. You'll see my email address there. Send me an email and say, hey, Richard, I opened my Moo Moo account. I have funded my Moo Moo account. I'm ready to take a look at your wealth transfer blueprint video to see if these three investments are right for me. And if they are, copy my plan. If they're not, create your own plan. But at least you got something to look at. You'll know what I'm doing to double my net worth. Also, I did a Moo Moo um, tutorial video because I know a lot of y'all have been asking me, hey, Richard, I'm new to this brokerage thing. I'm new to investing. Can you give me a, some type of a, a tutorial to walk me through? Now, I'm not the, 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 the master at these tutorials, guys. I'm just a regular guy who, who did a tutorial to show you the basic stuff. Really, the real master at this is the Moomoo Moo app itself because it has in-app tutorials. But you got to be able to find them. And that's what my video does. It'll, it'll show you the basic things, what you need to do to buy and sell an ETF or, or an individual stock. And then it'll show you key areas in the app to find certain things that you're looking for, like those in-app tutorials that can teach you pretty much anything you want to know about trading paper assets. It will help you navigate the app to find those things faster. It just collapsed timeframes for you and get you there quicker. So if you want that Moo Moo tutorial video, again, down in the description box, you'll see my email address. Send me an email. Open the Moo Moo account. I funded my Moo Moo account. Send me the wealth transfer blueprint video and send me the Moo Moo tutorial video so that I can get off to a good start and start changing some things in my financial life. Guys, you can change your financial life, but it starts today. Right. I've given you information that shows you kind of what's happening. Now, it's your decision if you want to stay in the matrix. But you know the truth now. So if you want to stay in the matrix anyways, then stay there. They, they will welcome you with open arms. They'll welcome you. They'll keep you there for the rest of your life. And then, like I said, by the time you retire at 65 years old, they're going to throw you a little bone. But that little bone ain't going to have no meat on it. It's only going to be Social Security, a couple thousand dollars a month. That ain't going to take care of nobody. Uh-uh. Not, no, not, not, not in the golden years. So, so if you want more than $2,000 a month Social Security check, you better get yourself out of the matrix and get over here as an investor where you start buying assets and building wealth and stop buying liabilities and creating debt for yourself over here in the matrix. It's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you. Thoughts become things. Oh, one other thing before I check out. Guys, I got a new Instagram page. It's brand new. I think I've had it a couple months. It's Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. It's all spelled correctly, guys. It ain't no double. It ain't no three L's in millionaire. It ain't no two N's in millionaire. It's, it, it's none, it ain't no underscores. It ain't no, it's Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. Here's the thing. Go down to my description box and click on that Instagram link. It'll take you directly there. Don't just go to Instagram and, and, and type it in because you're going it's, it's a million of them out there already that's fakes. What you do is, is you go down to the description box and you click on my Instagram link in the description box. That's the only way. And it's going to take you directly to my page. And here's another little FYI about my Instagram page. When you look at who I'm following, it'll say zero. And I did that on purpose so that you can differentiate me from the fakes. Mine is never going to follow anybody. So if you see followers in, in some fake Richard Fane millionaire mentor page, you know that ain't the real one because I'm not following anybody on my Instagram page. So when you go to my Instagram page, just look to the far right and you'll see where it says followers. It'll say zero. That means I'm not following anybody on Instagram. I'm not interested in following anybody on Instagram. The only reason I'm on Instagram is is I don't follow Coach Prime either. I don't follow Coach Prime at all on Instagram. I know somebody just distracted me with a random comment. 
I got no followers I'm following. I don't follow nobody on Instagram. So you'll know that's me. And I'm not going to follow anybody so that you know it's me. My only purpose for having that is for you guys to be able to DM me. That's it. And, and for me to be able to put up reels from time to time promoting financial freedom. That's it. That's it. That's all I use Instagram for. I'm not there to be, ooh, that's cute. Ooh, golly, look at her. Ooh, blah, blah, blah. nah, I don't need all that. I don't need any of that. Only reason I'm on there is for you guys to have easy access to me. So if you want to follow me, go down to the description box. Click on the Instagram link. Look to the far right where it says follow, following, following, not followers, following. You'll see it says zero, and then you'll know that's me. Well, all right, let's get out of here. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy, get wealthy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.